I'm going to start with a story that I think is extremely inspiring. It certainly is to me, and I hope it will be to you and to us as a church as well. Um, I received a phone call in September, or actually a message on uh, Facebook to start with, and it was by a young lady that I had, been, had in my youth group 25 years before that, and she said, I just wanted to tell you that 25 years ago today is when you prayed with me to receive Christ, and I just want you to know how much a difference it's made in my life. And this young lady's name is Venka. She was an exchange student from Norway. I don't know much about Norway, but the way she said her name was Venka Torkildsen. <laughs> so I think it must have something like that. And she was, she grew up in a kind of stayed Lutheran background and she knew about God, but she didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus. And I had the privilege in the year that she was there in Linden to lead her to Christ. And then she went on and I lost track of her for many years. Um, she got involved in a number of ministries and she ended up being a social worker in the Philippines in the town of Manila. And she developed a deep friendship with this woman named Edith, whom she calls Edie. And they served together, they're both single, and this was their calling in life. And so they every now and then would get out of the, the hardness of their social work life and the toughness of living in Manila, and they would go on vacation. And they found this wonderful, beautiful island called Chemigan. It's a little tiny island. The, the road all the way around the outside is 40 miles. It's a little volcanic island, and it's right off the coast of several of the other Philippine islands. And so they found that as their wonderful place to go and to get away from it all. And she said, you know, it was amazing. It was our third visit there. And she said we were there for a week. And she said we still had two days left in our vacation. And she said both of us were sitting there by the pool. And we'd been around the island and we'd realized here's an island of 80,000 people. And there's no churches except the, the Spanish had settled the island. And so... There were the old Spanish churches, and there was the old Catholic tradition of just following the rules, but not a relationship with Christ. And she said, we were both sitting by the pool, and she said, I'd never had any kind of vision or any kind of special thing from God like that, but she said, both of us felt like we were supposed to try to do something at this island. And here there are two dare I say, middle-aged ladies that are single, that have no background, they've not no Bible school training, they've got nothing. And they said God put on their hearts to create a resort that would fund a ministry that would someday build a church. And she said we were scared to death. We had no idea how to do it. And she said we had two more days left on our vacation and we spent them looking for real estate. And we found a piece of ground that was worth $14,000. And she said, we went home and we said, if God's going to do this, he's got to provide. We have no church to sponsor us. We have no ministry or mission. And so they began to share. She said, we shared it with 10 people. The burden that God had put on our heart and the vision. And she said, there was a friend of mine from Norway that said, I believe in what God is doing. And five days later, they had $14,000 to start that. And she said, we did not know what we were doing. But they began with the process. They bought this peeps of steep hillside that had trees and brush on it. And they began to clear it out and make it a garden, and they began to build little cabins. And she would invite most of her Norwegian friends, you know, come down from the frozen north to spend some time on a tropical island, and she's the safe person that, that knows how to get us there and how to take care of us. And She said, God began to work in the ways that you wouldn't believe. She said, they, we began to do outreaches towards the children of the island. There were all kinds of poverty issues, and so they began to give them clothes. And then she said, as we were building the houses and as we were starting to build the little restaurant, she said, the workers would come and we would share with them about Christ, and people started getting saved. And what do you do when people get saved and you have no church? You start a Bible study that becomes a church. And she said it was this amazing progress and we, we started doing outreaches and we had put together school supplies and we would take them to the, to the local schools and, and those kids would walk out of there with those packages and they would have not only a smile on their face, they would have a contact with somebody who talked about Jesus in a way that was real and alive. And it has been an incredible adventure and I will tell you the rest of the story in a little bit. 
But I want you to think about what would you do if God put on your heart that you needed to do something incredible, amazing like that, like take the gospel to a place where it has never been, and how would you do it, and how would you start, and how would you not feel completely overwhelmed? And in this series, we've been talking about the big picture, how God wants to do what he wants to do with Family Church. And I hope it's been giving you some clarity and some vision about what it is that we're committed to and what it is that we're a part of. And I want to take you to a passage of Scripture in Acts chapter 2. If you have your Bibles turned there or you can put on the uh, app from Family Church and you can uh, actually take your notes there or you can look at the Scripture. And we're going to look at Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And it is what I call the church at the raw state. The church has just gotten formed. There's 3,000 people there. There is one church in the whole world, the Church of Jerusalem. And there were all kinds of people from out of town. There was all kinds of difficulties with how are we going to feed them and house them and all that kind of stuff. And this is a little, just a little snapshot of the essential things that have to go on in church, no matter where it is or how well it's organized or how it's formed. And I want to just give you a refreshing view of what the church is about. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. And they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. And they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They didn't have buildings. They didn't have boards. They didn't have plans. They just had a bunch of people that loved Jesus. And so what did they do? Well, it says, first of all, that they devoted themselves. And I think it's way too easy for us to be casually interested. And last weekend, we talked about the difference between being a fan of Jesus and a follower. But the word devoted means committed to that this is a high priority, that this is something that if nothing else is going to happen in my week, this is going to happen. And it says they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, which is exactly what we have here in the Word of God, isn't it? The apostles' teaching written down. And it says they were devoted to fellowship, to deep relationships. 3,000 people, they didn't all know each other, and they were connecting and getting to know each other. To the breaking of bread, if you were paying close attention In those five verses I read, it said breaking of bread twice. I think this one is talking about the remembrance of communion, of the Lord's table, of remembering the body and blood of Christ and how he's given his life for us. And then it says, and they were devoted to prayer. Doesn't say what time their service met, didn't say what kind of instruments they played, didn't say anything about the form. It said what was the thing they were devoted to. And I think it's beautiful when you realize that God didn't give a really crystal clear plan for the church because he had to have a plan that would work for this kind of brand new church and when the church very next few chapters became a persecuted church and they were running and hiding. In fact, I had a chance to visit in Rome the catacombs, which is where they buried the dead. And when the Christians were being persecuted in Rome, the only place they could gather together was down in the catacombs and there are crosses that are etched in the rock from 2,000 or almost 2,000 years ago. Why? Because they said we're devoted to this. It doesn't matter if it's easy. We're devoted to this. And then it says everyone was filled with the awe and wonders of the signs that God was doing to the apostles. And the believers were together. They were connected. They were deeply in relationship with each other to such a degree that those who were in poverty and couldn't have en- didn't have enough to eat, that those who had things were selling them so they could take care of other people. Why? Because they were the same family. They were connected. And then it says, every day they continued to meet together. So what days should the church meet? You see, the beginning part, it says they met, and it talks about a gathering. Well, very early in the church history, they moved to meeting on Sunday. Now, that wasn't too big a switch for the Jews. They had met every week on Sabbath all their lives, and now they move to Sunday. Why, why do Christians worship on Sunday? It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's called the Lord's Day. The Sabbath was 
a, a picture back to the creation, the re rest of God. Now this is the Sunday, which is a celebration of the resurrection. And it says they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. That was potluck's beginning. So this breaking of bread together is that relationship that you have when you invite somebody to your home and you feed them and you, you eat together and there's this connection. And then it says, and the third part, that the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So they didn't just become this little insular group that was taking care of themselves. They were involved in reaching out to others so that other people could know Christ. And then daily those were being added to the body. So how do we do that today? Well, every culture and every time frame and honestly every country does it a little differently. And that's okay. But at Family Church, we believe God has called us to make this clear statement of a mission of what we're about. So if you've been here the last few weeks, this is your test to see if you were listening. The mission of Family Church is what? Good. People helping people find and follow Jesus. That's what filling in those blanks is. So it's not just the church doing it, it's that each individual is helping other individuals find and follow Jesus. And then last, or a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the values, the ways that we're going to go about, the things that are going to be critically important to us in that process. And it was an acronym, TRIM. So what does TRIM stand for? T is transformation, okay. R is Relationships. <laughs> I is innovation. That God always has the same message, but he has different methods all the time. And M is for multiplication. This, this video of this message is available on our website. If you guys would like to go back and listen. You just didn't know there was going to be a test, did you? Okay, one more. This is a little bit more uh, transformation, relationships, innovation, and multiplication. One more. We said we need to have a clearer cut understanding of what a disciple is if our goal is to make disciples. So a disciple has three specific clear attributes. What are they? Finding or following Jesus Being changed by Jesus and on mission with Jesus. This message is also available on our website if you'd like to go back and refresh yourselves. Yeah, see, I, when they say that you forget 95% of what you hear, that's a very depressing statistic for preachers. So this process of saying, what is a disciple? How do we make disciples? How, do we, how are we disciples? And so how do we make all of that happen? Well, in our schedule in our lives with the way that, that culture works here, we want to make some specific challenges for how do we do these things of finding and following Jesus and helping others do that. How do we respond in this trim values? How do we make disciples? And it's going to be starting very, very simply. We need to gather often. Let me be specifically clear. My challenge to you for 2019 is that you make the church service and being here a high priority, if at all possible. Because somehow when we are together as a church family, there is an awe and a wonder and an encouragement, and we need each other. In fact, we sing songs of worship and praise that we've just done. We, we have a time of honoring the word and walking through. And I, and I hope as you listen to the message, it's also helping you as you study your own Bible so that you learn more about the word and how to study it. It's connecting in relationship. I know some of you hate that greeting time. I get that. But otherwise, there are people who come in and sit all by themselves and nobody ever talks to them on the way out. And is that a tragedy? When you come into the family of God where the love of God is supposed to be the earmark and nobody talks to somebody coming in and out, that should never happen. So we, we connect in relationships and then there's this giving of generosity. The, the early church talked about the needs that were met within the body and how those, the, the needs of the body were taken care of because people cared about each other and the mission of the church goes forward and how we serve each other. You see, a lot of that goes on on the weekend service. Now, honestly, the weekend service is the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole lot more to the church than that, but it's an incredibly important part 
of what God calls us to. And in fact, even in the early church, there were some people that were already starting to skip church. <laughs> it says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. That's, that's part of our goal of being together. And let's not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. And they didn't even have live stream yet. But encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. He said, if you're going to be devoted to the fellowship, devoted to the apostles' teaching, devoted to what God wants to do in your life, then you need to put a high priority on weekly coming together with believers. And I hear this, and I'm sure you do too. You don't have to go to church to be a believer. And I say, well, that may be true, but if you are a real believer, you want to go to church because you want to have that encouragement and strengthening. And and if for no other reason, if you don't need anything we offer, then we desperately need you because there's some people here you can disciple. And so we need to make that a priority to say, how are we going to follow the Lord? How are we going to make disciples? How are we going to do all these things? Well, we're going to do it because we're going to get together and we're going to have those relationships and we're going to honor God in that way. And the second part is that we need to make growth an intentional choice. We need to say, my spiritual zeal, my spiritual growth is not the church's responsibility, it's not the pastor's responsibility, it's my responsibility. And so I need to get myself into some place where I'm being challenged and encouraged more than just listening to a message, more than just a greeting time. And so we have 45 life groups and we challenge you regularly to get in and to find a life group. And to, some of them are guys group and some are women's group and some are young, uh, young adult groups and most of them are just mixed groups. But the goal there is to get you into the word and listen carefully. It's not enough just to hear somebody else talk about the Bible. We've already referenced how much we forget about that. You need to be in a place where you are doing self-discovery. Because if I tell you something, you remember it about that long. If God shows you something because you find it yourself and you have that aha moment, you will remember it. It is engrafted in your heart. You need a place not only to listen but to talk. You need a place to care for others and to be cared for. You need a place where where those relationships deepen beyond small talk, where you get comfortable enough to share what's really going on in your life and Ask somebody to pray with you or pray for others. You need to be close enough that when you know somebody in your, your, little, your little life group is having difficulties, that you sign up to take meals to their house after the surgery or you take them groceries when they don't have enough because you're connected. You can't do that with hundreds of people. You can only do that with a small group. And out of that, in, in Hebrews 3, he says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it's called today, so that none of, none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. There's a battle that goes on in every one of us, that our flesh pulls us back towards the world, back towards the old, back towards cooling off in our spiritual zeal. And he says you need to be together regularly, faithfully, in each other's lives because one of the keys to keeping our spiritual steam up is that we're with other people who will also challenge and encourage us. We need to be with people, and sometimes it's life groups, and sometimes it's one-on-one, somebody you meet for coffee regularly, sometimes it's one-on-three, sometimes, I just call it, there needs to be people in your life that you're having discipleship conversations with where you talk about more than the weather, although the weather's been very interesting lately. There's been lots of conversation about that. But you need to be saying, how are you doing? How is your marriage? How are you doing with your kids? I've noticed you haven't been at church for a while. We've missed you. Do you have people in your life that when your life falls apart at 2 o'clock in the morning, you got somebody you could call because you're deeply connected And maybe even more, do you have somebody that if they call you at 2 o'clock in the morning, you're willing to respond? Why? Because we need those kinds of deep connections with each other. We need to be devoted to the fellowship. And then God calls us to be more than just people who are focused on ourselves. We are supposed to go. And we've talked about this theme of people helping people find and follow Jesus. And that we want to be a church that's growing 
but we want to be a church that is focused not just on ourselves, but also around the world. And so I say we need to go near and far, that God's called every one of us to be a lighthouse. In fact, this verse (laughs) has a very specific challenge. It says, do everything without complaining or arguing. We, We did that as a as a theme verse for Mexico one year. Do everything without complaining or argument so that you'll be like stars in the sky, so that you'll shine, and that our homes need to be places where Christ is honored and then people can begin to see. That we need to be in our place of business. You know, we we are need to serving not only in the church, but wherever you work or wherever you go to school. God has you there for specific reasons, and there are people around you that God wants to reach out to through you. You see, we need to grow. And I challenge you, and I, I was thinking of this illustration because I have a, uh, a, fob, a fob on my keychain for a fitness club. And there was a period of time I was going very regularly, and then I started building a house. And, and I was still a member at the club, and I still had the fob for the door. Only I never went. You will never get in shape doing that. Some people are like that with the church, aren't they? I'm a member. I know where I'm going. I know how to be there. I belong there. I just not, I'm really not devoted. I am not serving. I'm not attending. I'm not listening. I'm not connecting. And you know what? I've gotten back at it now. I'm doing two, three times a week, and, and I'm getting back in shape, and I, and I feel better, and it's now doing some good. We need a, a picture that says, not only am I going to follow Jesus wholeheartedly, I'm going to be on mission with Jesus. And what that means is that I need my light wherever I go. If, I, if I'm a coach for Little League, if I am going to the gym, I need to be looking for chances to have those discipleship conversations. We need to also move to that place in our spiritual journey where it's not all about getting, it's about serving. And we need to serve both inside the church and some will serve outside the church. Either way, if you're serving Christ, that's okay. And inside the church, we actually try to help you serve and learn to serve because we believe, listen, not just that the church has jobs that need done, but that serving is a vital part of your spiritual development. That you will never continue to grow to maturity unless you get to the place where you're willing to give back. And we need people to help with children and with greeting. And we need people that will work on the audiovisual stuff. And we need people that will help with the care ministry. And we need people that will help in the office stuff. And there's whatever skills and abilities you might have, we can use those in the ministry of the kingdom of God. And it will put you in a relationship to people and it will give you a chance to serve God directly. But you can also do it by joining some kind of a club in town, by being a part of your neighborhood watch, by being somewhere where you can serve and point people to Jesus. Because if you're a lighthouse, everywhere you go is a chance for you to show that light. And then God also wants to stretch our hearts to the world around us. He wants to take us from just being focused on people that look like me and talk like me. And we have talked about how God has used going to Mexico with our, we started it with the young people because we knew the youth group was too selfish and they needed to get out of their own space and somewhere else. And then we started sending them a couple years and realized that the whole church actually had that same problem. And so we have been sending teams down and God has used that in us as a church. And now we've adopted some people groups in Cambodia and we've had individuals in our church go to, um, we've had some that have gone to, I think, Afghanistan, I want to say, or one of the countries as a nurse. We've had people who have gone to Cuba. We've had people that are serving in all kinds of different places. And God wants to stretch our hearts and let us be part of that. And then there's one other thing that we have put in because it doesn't seem to fit under any of the others and it seems to be vital. And that is, you'll see on your, your shell, it says, gather, grow, go, and equip. And there are things that seem to be needing of a special focus. And so how do we fit those into the schedule? Well, we have classes. We have classes specifically for healing and renewal. Some people have lost loved ones and they're dealing with grief. Some people have been abused or deeply hurt. And they need a process of not only healing but learning how to forgive. Some people have been through the 
the ugly process of an abortion and they need to find that God can bring healing and wholeness and help and so there's a ministry for that. So there are, there are classes that help people with, first of all, the renewal side of it and then there are also classes that help people with special specific needs like Financial Peace University, how to handle your finances in a way that honors God and learn to talk about it with others. You need to have a class for how to raise your children and so we've got Raising Highly Capable Kids and Love and Logic. So there are specific classes and sometimes I think it would be cool if a whole life group took a, a section of time and just went to that class and then went back to doing life group or maybe you step out of your life group for a little while to go and take those classes. And we're going to talk more about having seasons of classes so that you can make those specific things happen in an already busy schedule. Because what we know is you already have all kinds of other things that are pulling at your time and your life. And we're just saying if we want to be a church that is effective in our community, we want to be a church where people are finding and following Jesus, then there are certain basic commitments we need to make. And we need to say this is a priority and I'm going to make it happen. And I heard this saying years ago. It said most people overestimate what they can do in a week and underestimate what they can do in 10 years. And I think that's true. It's incredible what God can do if you faithfully give him a piece of every week and then over time, God begins to do amazing things. I want to go back to this story of the Philippines. These two young ladies have been leading this ministry since 2001 and they have several cabins now and they had a steady flow of people coming to be a part of that resort and that helped fund this beautiful restaurant is what they made and out of that they built a church where 140 people are meeting every weekend and there are some 400 people that are associated with that church in some way and they're doing outreaches to all kinds of places they do vacation bible schools and they are reaching out to this island where there was not a protestant church available and she said to me i am more surprised than anybody and i can't believe what god has done and the partnership between Venka and the Edith has been this beautiful thing. And they've actually been talking about us coming over there for some years. And finally this year, Jan and I are going to go over and spend a couple of weeks there in May. And we're going to focus on how do we bring enough structure? How do we bring some pastoral training? They've got a young guy that's in Bible school. He's in his third year and he's preaching there every weekend. Venka says, we're learning quite a bit of Greek right now. <laughs> she says, why? Because they have a pastor who's in Bible school. But this process of God taking this raw, unformed vision of two women who said we had no experience and no possibilities of doing this. And God has done a miracle. And he's making a difference on that island. And if you could look back with me now, what a difference Family Church has made in Douglas County. I've seen over the years how God has changed lives, how people have come to faith, how families have been restored, how marriages have been healed. And what would it look like if you and I became fanatically devoted to being on mission with Jesus? And that instead of a bunch of people who come in for a show once in a while, we became an army that said everywhere we go, we want to take Jesus with us. And we want to be devoted to being together and we want to be connected in life groups but we also want to be involved in how do we take Jesus to the neighborhoods and the schools, the places where we are influencing others. And what would it look like if we began to have those discipleship conversations in the grocery stores and in the health clubs and in all kinds of places where people got to hear about Jesus and they wanted to find out what it is that makes you tick and how it is that you are able to have a life in the middle of this screwed up world that we live in where you shine like stars in the universe. And you see, I know every single one of us have a tendency to think, I'm not that important. I can't do that much. I don't have much influence. I don't know enough. We have more excuses than Moses. And God wants to use every single one of us. And so the whole picture of this series has been to say, let's get the big picture. What does God want to do and how do we break it down? And, and we as leaders have tried to make this a simple process to say, what is a disciple and what are our values and what are we about so that we can be crystal clear, so that we can challenge you to say, will you believe God with us? Will you trust him 
to do something bigger in your life than you ever dreamed possible. And you know what? God delights in taking unlikely people and unlikely scenarios and doing something great. And our prayer when we came to Sutherland was, God, may you do something so great here that everybody will know it had to be you. And God is at work, is he not? And I firmly believe that the best days of family church are still ahead of us, that God's going to do more. And do you think there's a difference in Douglas County because family church is here? Yeah, there is. And God is at work, and we want to see him work even in greater ways. I'm going to hand off to Pastor Will in green and Pastor Sky down in the South Umqua, our new campus that's down there. Love you guys. Let me make a very specific challenge. I know that we have busy lives. But I want to tell you, at the end of your week, all your time is always gone. Everybody has exactly the same number of hours. The only question is, what are you doing with the time that you have? What are you doing to get past the excuses to live for what God's called you to? And I want you to think about whatever your schedule is. If I had two more hours to give to God... If I said I, I want to definitely be there on a weekend service and share in fellowship together and hear the message, but if I could give my time in some way to make a difference for the kingdom of God, what would I do? If I wasn't afraid, if there was no hindrances, what would I do? And you see, when I talked to Venka about she and Edith, she said we were sitting there by the pool and God gave us such a strong vision that this is what we were supposed to do. And she said it was an amazing, impossible vision, but the peace of God just flowed over us. And God began to work. And see, God is looking for people who will just say, okay. And you begin to say, God, I want my time to count for something that's going to last and going to matter. Because most of us can't even remember what we did last week. And time goes so fast. And my challenge is that we become more devoted to the things that matter. And we begin to avoid the things that don't matter. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you for our love for you that comes because of your love for us. Thank you for people who've been devoted to you and have given us a vision and passion. Thank you for the team that we have, for the, the people that you have here at Family Church. Thank you for the difference that you are making in our community. And Father, I pray that right today you might step up our challenge. You might give us the courage to say, I want to do something that matters with my life. And I don't even know what, what that's going to look like, God, but I'm already saying yes. And I want to give my time to things that will last. I want to be somebody who helps people find and follow Jesus. And Father, I pray that you would stir that vision in us. You would give us that heart desire, and then you would show us how it can happen. In Jesus' great name. And everybody said, amen. amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me. Or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.